let's hear it from Druba Orthakur. All right, he is the CTO and co-founder of Rockset, who you just saw some t-shirts from. The Data Is My Rock was one of them. And Druba, how you doing, man? I see you are here with hey. us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. I has been attend I was attending your previous talk and it was great fun. Nice. Very cool. Right on. Well, I'm going to hand it over to you and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Sure, yeah. Hey, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me present my slides before I go there. Okay. Cool. Hey, thank you. Thanks a lot again, Dimitro, for introducing me. I really appreciate it. Um, I know a lot of folks here are very much machine learning focused. I'm really excited to hear some of their stories as well. Uh, and as you folks, as practitioners of machine learning models on operations, you probably have all experienced um, like kind of a data analytical backends, right? Because you first need to, or at, at some point in time, you'd have to deploy your kind of models in production. And that's the time when data analytics becomes super, super relevant and useful. So today I'm here to talk a little bit about the data analytics side of the story. How can you run these machine learn, learn machine learn models in production on large data sets when data is changing rapidly and you want to deploy more models and you want to make sure that you are operating on the latest data. So a quick introduction about myself. Um, I am the CTO and co-founder at Rockset. So Rockset is a data analytics uh, engine that focuses on real-time analytics and serving real-time machine learning models in production. Um, prior to Rockset, I was the founding engineer of an open source database called RocksDB. Some of you might have heard about it because um, it's a very high performant key value store that is used to um, run some of these big machine learning models in production at Facebook. That's when I was building RocksDB. Um, this was probably like eight years back. Uh, before that, I was building a lot of Hadoop file system. Um, it's again, the granddaddy of all kind of big data and machine learning that ever started. This is back in 2006, I think, when I was doing a lot of Hadoop file system. I was the third um, engineer in the project. Um, and I, at that time, I didn't realize how big Hadoop is and how it's going to revolutionize the whole kind of the data industry in general. I've worked on some other projects uh, over time as well. So today, um, the talk that I'm having here is mostly about talking about how can you serve these big machine learning models that you have built in production systems. So I'll talk a little bit about the evolution of how we have got um, data processing in general, how data processing has evolved from batch to real time. And I'm going to focus a lot on what as a data practitioner, what are the things that I'm going to look for to see what kind of backend systems I should use for serving these big models in production. Again, I'm going to take questions. So please ask me questions, please uh, put it in the Slack. I might pause a minute or two in the middle just to kind of answer your questions and answer them as we go. So where has data processing been? Uh, again, Hadoop has, is where a lot of big data processing started way back in 2006 or five or somewhere around there. Uh, the systems were very much batch processing at the time where you collect a lot of data, then you build your models um, for maybe a couple of days and then serve it in production after a few days or a few hours. You don't deploy models like every day or every week. Um, that was kind of where most of the big data processing systems started. Uh, over time, we see a lot of spark, of course, right? This is again, another critical piece of our infrastructure where maybe uh, there's a lot of ETL processes to be done because you need fresh data for to run your machine learning models. Um, and so the latency of these um, models, the latency of fresh data that they get is maybe a few minutes or a few hours at the most. And over time, people are moving to more real-time processing, which means that can I deploy my models in real time in a few millisecond latency or a few second latency of the real data that's coming in, into my production systems. Um, about real-time analytics, I'll give two or three examples of how I have seen from very close uh, because some of our users do this is that how to deploy, how to build models and how they deploy it in production, especially uh, when they're very much focused on real-time analytics. So this is a great example, like take for example, 
there is a company which is maybe um, tens of thousands of trucks on the road. They're like shipping goods from one place to another. They're like uh, delivering um, uh, construction material uh, from one place to another. And they're really sensitive about how these, the fleet is being managed. Um, the vehicles might get stranded sometimes. They have sensors in these vehicles and they want to make sure that if there is uh, certain signals coming from these sensors, their machine learning model in the back end can actually process them in real time and immediately figure out what is the reaction or what is the decision to be taken to fix the issues that are coming into their delivery system. Uh, this gives them a lot of bang for the buck because their operations become really simplified and smooth because decisions are made on the most real data sets that they are getting. Uh, another use case that I'm seeing very close uh, from very close are about online gaming systems. So hundreds of players or thousands of players are playing an online game. And um, there is a machine learning model that kind of matches players with uh, the games that they play, or as soon as a player logs in, uh, the system needs to match him with a game event that is being played with a similar skill levels of users. Again, the model has been built, but then how do you run it in production where it can look at data that has just come in a few seconds back, like who is playing the game right now, who are the people who are logging in and then do this matchmaking in real time. Another great example of where real time is super useful for, uh, for some of these models that are being used in production. So real time is the focus of this talk today. Um, real time essentially are difficult systems to build. Uh, real time systems are usually hard. So a lot of machine learning models in general might be deployed every maybe a longer periodicity uh, on, or on data that is kind of stale. But here we are talking about how can we build systems or how can we decide which systems to use when we need our models to be running on real time data. If data is changing rapidly, what are the things I should look for to figure out what systems to use to build, to deploy my models in production? Uh, there are a lot of data systems out there. Mm, of course, you might be familiar with some of them. Uh, all of them claim that oh, they're all real time. You can run models on large data sets in production and those models can look at the most recent data. So it's kind of sometimes difficult to separate uh, the wheat from the chaff and like figuring out which ones would actually be useful if I need real-time analytics. So the talk again here is to kind of declutter this space and talk about uh, what are the things I should look for as a data practitioner. I should look for to decide which system to use. So I have a checklist of items and I'm hoping that this checklist make things easy or uh, useful for a lot of our data practitioners. Uh, these are the kind of things that I'm going to, I usually use myself to evaluate which data system to use for deploying my models in production. Uh, I'm going to I have a list of eight, uh, eight characteristics that I typically use to evaluate these systems. And I'm hoping that you can use some of these points to consider uh, or consider these points to evaluate your data system as well and your data application as well. I'm going to cover only three or four of these today. Uh, the first one that really matters to a lot of um, systems that need to deploy uh, models that need to look at real-time data is burst to traffic. So in production, there is always burst to traffic. Uh, what is burst to traffic? Um, it's about the variations of new data coming in or the amount of queries coming into your system, right? Um, into, into the system that's serving your models. Take for example, Amazon Prime Day. Um, on that day, the first time it was shipped, this is a great um, article that they've written, how the load on our system increased like three times compared to a normal day. So this is bursty traffic, right? Your system has to deal with these kind of bursty traffics. If I, when I was at Facebook, I saw that on Halloween day, the photo storage system just exploded. A lot of people are, are putting in photos. It's like two or three times more than a normal photo sharing day in the Facebook world. So how does a system, um, so how did um, Amazon handle that burst of traffic? There are, two there are two ways that they handled burst of traffic. One was that their backend was designed for the cloud, which means that they can scale up and scale down uh, system when it's needed and when it's not needed. And also they had a disaggregated architecture. And this is the point that I really wanted to double click today. Uh, what is the disaggregated architecture and why is this architecture really useful for companies like Amazon and Rockset and other folks as well. 
to make sure that we can handle burst traffic and serve these models even when there's a burst of data. Uh, a new, um, again, uh, when you're talking about disaggregated architecture, the two, the two pieces of infrastructure that are needed to solve or to serve these models are obviously data, but then to serve the data, you need compute and you need storage. So they're two different things, right? Compute and storage are two different things. So compute is how much processing you need to serve the model. And then storage is how much total data set you need to look at when you're, when you're evaluating this model and doing some inferencing. So the two different things, they're very much, the compute is very much like say the brain uh, that you have, that all of us have, which basically is used for computation. And to scale it up and down, you need to do a certain set of exercises. Maybe you need to play Sudoku puzzles, or you need to do some other kind of puzzles to keep your brain active and functional and able to perform. But on the other hand, storage, which is where your data is, is very much like, let's say, the body that you have, which is you need to do a different set of muscles or muscle exercises to be able to keep in shape. So just like that, uh, very similar to this is how the disaggregated architecture works. It basically separates the compute and storage. So you can do two different things to these two pieces to scale them up and down when there is more load in the system. Uh, a very new way that has arrived in the last few years is that a lot of these systems use the aggregator leaf tailor architecture to kind of uh, have this data infra so that you can scale up and down compute storage separately. So in this picture, I'll spend maybe, maybe I'll double click on one or two boxes of this. So data is coming in from, let's say your production systems, which are like databases, data streams, or warehouses, data lakes. Uh, you're doing some machine learning um, or you're evaluating the model as part of, or part of the model as part of the tailor process, which is essentially doing some pre-processing and then storing this data in the leaf nodes, which is where all, all your storage is. And then when queries come in from your users or from your applications, they come in through like a two level aggregator that hits the leaves and returns you back. So the key part of this is that the, this architecture uh, separates the writes and the reads. So the writes or the new data is happening on the left side of this picture and the queries are all happening on the right side of this picture. So this is basically follows the CQRS pattern that many of us are familiar with in software. Uh, where the writes are completely segregated from the, from the reads. So this is the advantage is that even if you have bursty traffic, uh, the bursty traffic could mean a lot of high volume data. So the tailors scale up, uh, and but it doesn't impact your queries. Your queries can still get the low latency that you need. Similarly, if your queries increase suddenly um, and you have a lot of aggregators, uh, but your latency of your data or your data freshness is not compromised because the tailors can keep up and keep ingesting New data to serve your models. So this is um, this the, this is not a uh, this architecture is kind of new, but it has been first populated, I think, as far as I know, in the Facebook ALT. Facebook uses this architecture for uh, serving the machine uh, for serving the feed. Like when you log into the Facebook app, you probably see all your friends post comments, likes. Right? There's a very complicated machine learning model in the back end serving that data. You don't see all of your friends posts. There's like relevance matching, sorting, um, ranking, a lot of things happen in real time before you actually see the feed. And this feed is generated in real time. The moment you click refresh, there's a query that goes to the back end, runs this model in production on most recent data and then sends you results. Um, what at that time when I was working at Facebook, we, did, we saw that user engagement increases rapidly when the data latency is low and when the data is real time, right? So the focus of this ALT architecture that Facebook uses was very much to kind of um, make sure that data is always fresh and it is a real time analytics backend. Uh, similarly, LinkedIn also uses the ALT architecture for the follow feed. Uh, they have published some blogs that we can talk about. I just put it for reference here. I'm not going to deep dive there. Um, so that was the first, so the first thing we talked about is bursty traffic. And we said that bursty traffic, we should analyze a data system based on how can they handle bursty traffic? Do they use the ALT architecture or do they use a very batch processing architecture that will distinguish, that will tell us which system to use if I need real time and which system to use if I need batch. And the second point in my checklist is about complex queries. Uh, so your data system, the way when I evaluate a data system, I look at it to see, does it serve complex queries? 
And if it does, that's the real one that I need to use for my machine learning models because usually when I'm serving these models in production, a lot of complex, complex um, uh, analysis needs to happen right within a few milliseconds before you can actually serve it to production. Um, very early on, I was, like I said, I was part of the original Hadoop team um, back at Yahoo in 2005. And one of the first use cases I still remember where um, Morgan Stanley, one of the financial companies, they were using Hadoop um, and they were actually looking at a lot of mortgage instruments, a lot of deeds, lots of financial documents that they have to figure out how to give a loan to a customer, right? Um, and that needed a really complex query that needed to look at five different data sets um, to, 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 make, to, to figure out what is the, um, the rate at which I can give a loan to a person or a company. And this was all done using Hive uh, on Hadoop. So Hive is a very complex language. It supports SQL. Uh, we can talk about it as well. Uh, because it was Hive was used at a time on top of Hadoop because uh, it had to do aggregations, it had to do joins, and it has to combine these data sets to give you your credit score, for example, or a company's uh, loan rate. The challenge uh, with, with some of these backends is that they don't, not all backends are equal, can, e can support equally complex queries. So this is a great a feature for people who, who is picking a data system to figure out which data system to use based on, can this support aggregations? Can this support joins? So joins um, usually um, is a very complex backend operation where you have to join two tables. For example, in this case, there are two tables of say a size 50K and 150K records, but when you join it, the intermediate data set will be really big. So a lot of data systems don't support joins because they say that, well, um, you, you don't ever have to join two tables when you're serving models in production. But I disagree because I think it depends on the complexity of your model. Now, um, query optimizers obviously have to support joins as well automatically. So this is another uh, thing that you can check to see how can the query optimizer handle this automatically for you. <clears throat> Sometimes it's difficult to kind of, um, um, to, sometimes it's difficult to figure out uh, if you're comparing two data systems to compare and figuring out which one to pick. Uh, sometimes both the data systems might look the same. It's like um, if you look at two birds, uh, if maybe you're walking down the park and you see two black birds on the tree, you might see that you might think that, oh, they're the same things. But actually what happens is that when you go closer, you probably see that why it's possible that you could actually have mistaken a cuckoo for a crow. And so they talk, they talk completely different language. And this is what I mean by um, data systems that might look same from far away, but they're really different when you go close by and you see, do they support joins? Do they support complex queries? And the ones that support joins are really useful for analytical systems or analytics that you want to use to serve your models in production. A lot of data systems are moving to SQL in, in general because SQL supports complex language, complex query language. Uh, Kafka, MongoDB, all of them are moving to some flavor of SQL. And even when you look at developers, a lot of developers um, love SQL just because it's a very complex and powerful language and you can, it's a very expressive language and it needs to support joins. So this is the second point that you can use to kind of uh, compare and contrast uh, different data systems when you're in the process of picking which data system should I use to serve my analytics. Uh, the third one that the third point in my checklist that you can use to figure out which system to use to serve your analytics is does the system have flexible schema. So this is important because usually machine learning models are running on data that is semi structured that is data that's coming in not fully formatted and if you want real time then you cannot afford to do a lot of cleaning and pipelining and making it ready for your production models to run. So take, for example, this is, there are two different records coming in. And here you would see some records have more fields than the other records, right? So you need to have a, you need to have a system where your system can handle these two records without having to do a lot of pipelining, flattening or cleaning. Uh, this is what I mean by flexible schema. Does your data system support flexible schema? because flexible schema is messy. 
some of, some of it you have to clean up, which de adds delays to your system. You could do that, but it adds delays to your system and the system is not real time. Uh, it also, if you have flexible schema, it also makes you move faster because you can deploy new models in production without having to take a downtime of this. So is flexible schema a new thing or has it been in existence for a while? So this is the question that I sometimes um, get from a lot of my um, people who, who might chat with. And it's not easy. Not everybody has jumped onto the flexible schema bandwagon because sometimes it's tough to do it, um, especially because you cannot get SQL queries on flexible schema. So this is, this is the challenge for a lot of data systems where you have JSON data or semi-structured data, but then can you run SQL on it? And you cannot because you need to first clean up and, and, and make it better or flatten before you can actually run it. So Rockset has a way to do this. Um, I don't want to deep dive here, but you can go look at some of the Rockset blog posts on how Rockset actually can take uh, JSON data and make SQL queries out of the end. Uh, other systems also, uh, they have trouble, take for example, Postgres, you do an alter table, uh, add a column, you have to take it off, you have to keep it offline. Uh, CockroachDB, very difficult, um, or I shouldn't say very difficult, but easier than Postgres, but still there are big limitations on changing schemas online, so you have to take it down. And then Hive, obviously, is very flexible, but again, uh, it's not the most performance system that you, that you could be, use. So again, flexible schema is a great way for you to figure out, should I use this data system or shall I use the other data system for serving my real-time analytical needs? Um, the fourth is about low latency queries. So a lot of these machine learning models are complex in nature. We already talk, talked about it, but then they also need low latencies because a lot of it is user-facing applications or um, leaderboards for gaming systems, right? Or, um, or some back or some other uh, app that cannot afford to wait for 10 minutes before the query returns. So how can we get low latency queries? Um, so this is an example of, um, of uh, there's one technique that a lot of data systems use to give you low latency queries that's called indexing. And what is indexing? Indexing is essentially taking all your data and then creating pointers to this data so that you can get to the data when a query comes. A simple way to explain is that, let's say you have a book of 500 pages and you're looking for a string. One option is to scan all the pages and find the string, find the page where the string exists. The other option is to go to the end of the book and look at the index that somebody's already built for you. And then use the page number from there and go back to the page that where the string appears. So you can see how fast the indexing technique is compared to scanning all the pages of the book. So this is what is a database index. It builds indexes so that you can query the index. So your queries are really fast and it lets, takes less CPU, less compute to serve the query. So indexing is a standard technique. Uh, like when I used to work at Facebook, Facebook has a database called a social graph. And uh, um, uh, there are inverted indexes built or secondary indexes built on this social graph so that you can answer queries like, when you do a Facebook check-in, you want to see all the people who checked into the same place. Now you can use the inverted index or the secondary index to find out all the people, uh, all the people who are checked into that into the, into that location earlier. Mm. So indexing is a really powerful way to serve these complex machine learning models in production, and queries become really fast. So this is um, you can ask if you're trying to look at if you're trying to consider two different data systems, you can ask yourself. Uh, does the system support indexing? Can I use it to, to make my system, uh, to, to make sure that my queries run very fast and um, maybe in a few milliseconds or a few seconds and can still process a lot of data as part of the query. So indexing all fields definitely the, something that you can consider um, or make your data system do when you are when you're serving queries in production. And it's not just indexing, it's also the queries. If you make two different types of queries, the query system should be optimal or optimized enough to automatically pick the right index to use so that as the machine learning um, model application developer, I don't really have to worry which index to use uh, when I'm serving that model. So again, uh, traditional ways, they mostly do MapReduce and scanning method and the new uh, systems which do real-time um, model serving, they mostly use a converged indexing technique to serve these models, large models in production. Um, <clears throat> any questions so far? Uh, okay, 
let's go, uh, let's keep going. So mutability is the last and the final point that I wanted to touch upon is mutability. What is mutability? Mutability is the way that uh, is a feature where you can actually update an existing record, right? Instead of um, appending to, to existing records. So take for example, a Facebook event record. Uh, somebody posted a Facebook event like a whale watching. And so now, Mm, there's a lot of machine learning model that runs in Facebook, which detects if this event is a spam event, right? So how does it figure out it's a spam event? There's, it has to look at a lot of data and then mark the, mark the item as, a, as, is this a fraud event or is it a valid event? So if it's an immutable system, um, the traditional data systems, you write all the original events into one place and then you'll, add, um, you, you add the marker, your machine learning model will add, an, add a marker saying that these events are bad and you can write it to a different place. And then, then when you're querying, you now you, your query system has to combine these two data sets, like um, the events itself, and then look at another place to see, is it marked a spam before you know, the application decides whether to render this event to the end user or not. So it's a complexity for the user when you have an immutable system. On the other hand, if it is an immutable system, which basically supports updates, let's say you have these three records and the spam detection finds that the first one is a spam, it is just going to go uh, update it and mark it as spam. So now the application, as an application developer, it becomes very easy because the data is mutable and the machine learning models are updating these models in production or updating fields of the data in production and the application developer makes it really uh, has a much easier life building applications. Again, mutable systems are making a comeback. You probably see it in, in, in real life as well, like Snowflake, Redshift. It's very difficult to deploy real-time models in production because they don't change. They're all append-only systems. Uh, whereas MySQL, Sybase, and other, uh, and even Ro Oracle or even Rockset, they're like all write, uh, read-write systems. So you can actually leverage the mutability of the, of the system to deploy real-time models in production. So those are the four or five check, checklist items that I had in mind mm, that I thought I would discuss with you. Uh, as a wrap up, I just try to re-summarize what we discussed today and I hope to get a lot of questions from you on Slack or after this, uh, after my presentation. So a lot of machine learning models, we talked about fleet management, we talked about gaming systems, they're all moving from batch to real time. They have to make sure that the models run in real time mode. And uh, to, make that, to, to make that happen, um, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, a lot of people have adopted the modern real-time data stack. Uh, and then this discussion was mostly focused on people who are trying to pick or select between different data stacks and how can they pick the right one? So this is a checklist that I have, which talks about the things that I should look at to figure out what data systems to use if I use one real timeliness on, of my backend serving. Um, and of course, Rockset is one of them, uh, which basically uh, is a real-time analytic system. So you can actually deploy large data sets uh, or you can deploy machine learning models on large data sets that are constantly changing or fluctuating or up being updated uh, without having to deal with that hands-on. The system deals, uh, does the right thing so that all your queries are fast and you can actually get um, maybe uh, one second of data latency compared to when data is processed, produced by, till the time when the data is actually being used by the model to make decisions. So that's the advantage of using Rockset and Rockset uses all these eight checklist items or uh, tick marks each of the checklist items that I have here, which describes how the system works. So again, um, thank you, thanks a lot. Uh, I will take some questions if there are any, uh, but you can also send me email or contact me at uh, on the Slack channel as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I have one quick question for you. And then sure. I know that time is, is of the essence. Uh, mm -hmm. You were working on Hadoop in 2005 and you've been in the game since then. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a war story? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I still remember the, actually I'll tell you a very interesting story there, right? Uh, the first time I have, we ever put um, uh, Hadoop um, on a system that was running Oracle earlier. People used to have a lot of difficulty producing reports within 24 hours. 
And then when it put like a maybe 30 node Hadoop cluster or maybe 20 something node Hadoop cluster, those reports used to come out in 15 minutes, right? Uh, the war story was before actually Hadoop happens, which is what we are struggling to figure out how to make these reports run faster because if the daily report is more than 24 hours, there's no value to this report, right? Uh, and then when it took 15 minutes, people were thinking, is this magic? Is this black magic? What are you folks doing? So it was real fun at the early days. <laughs>